Tonight at six, Prince William breaks his silence after the interview with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. On a visit to a school, he says the royals are not racist. Have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is the, the royal family a racist family, sir? Yeah, we're very much not a racist family. It comes after Prince Harry and Meghan said a member of the royal family had asked how dark their baby's skin would be, also tonight. The police officer being questioned on suspicion of murdering Sarah Everard is taken to hospital for a head injury. More than four and a half million people in England are now waiting to start hospital treatment, a record number. The boom in lockdown puppies prompts a sharp rise in the number of people falling victim to pet scammers. You shrewd and knavish sprite. And virtual Shakespeare using the latest technology to get audiences back into theatre. Coming up on Sports Day later in the hour on BBC News, a year on from the last match to take place in front of a full house, we look at the tragic impact of that game at Anfield. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. Prince William has made his first public comment since the interview with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex was broadcast four days ago, saying the royals are very much not a racist family. The Duke of Cambridge also revealed he'd not yet spoken to his brother, but said he would do so. In the interview, Meghan and Prince Harry said a member of the royal family had expressed concern over how dark their son Archie's skin might be. Our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. It is an allegation which strikes at the very core of an institution, the purpose of which is to unify. Bringing out a part of the suggestion by the Sussexes in the Oprah Winfrey interview of a racist attitude within the royal family has stung deeply. What? And so on a visit by the Cambridges to a school in East London, Prince William took the opportunity gently to push back. Sir, have you, broke, have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. And, and can you just let me know, is the, the royal family a racist family, sir? No, we're very much not a racist family. Like the Queen's statement on Tuesday, William's comments were short and to the point. We are not a racist family. That is the message the family wants and needs to be heard. <laughs> And the evidence across decades of work by the Queen in the context of the Commonwealth and by, in particular, the Prince of Wales here in Britain supports the proposition that equality and diversity are important to the royal family. Even those with reservations about their recent performance accept that good work has been done. In terms of the Prince of Wales's previous work, that can't be denied. We, we absolutely, you know, we acknowledge that he's done some excellent work with communities. But how damaging for the family is the loss of the Duchess of Sussex? I think it's a hugely, hugely missed opportunity. Um, I know from my own personal perspective as a mixed race woman, when Meghan Markle joined the royal family, I was so happy, so pleased. There was an opportunity for diverse communities to see themselves reflected in the royal family. The Queen believes this is a matter for the family to sort out. Logically, she will take the lead to try to heal the family rifts. But there's another big challenge for them, to underline to the watching world that, as William said today, this is not a racist family. And Nick is with me now. So four days after this interview was broadcast and Prince William still hasn't spoken to his brother, underlining, I suppose, that rift. I think that's absolutely right. I think it also underlines that they feel the need to let feelings subside for a few days. It is a very big family rift. There is a lot of family hurt and anger, not least because of the reputational damage. Reputational damage abroad, particularly in the United States, damage to the institution which the Queen has spent nearly 70 years now protecting and nurturing. So how do you restore that? Now, the traditional view, I'm sure, should be just let the facts speak for themselves. Let people remember all the work that we've done on equality and diversity. I would think, and the evidence today of William is, that William and perhaps his father think that we need to be rather more proactive. We need to be more assertive in saying that racism is wrong and we are not racists. This is the position in which the Sussexes have put them. So 
Restoring family equilibrium is one part of the challenge, and the Queen, I think, will take the lead in that. But repairing reputational damage is the other part, and they will all need to be involved in that. Nick Witchell, thank you. The Metropolitan Police officer who's been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Sarah Everard has been treated in hospital for a head injury. He was injured while in custody but is now back at a police station. Detectives investigating the disappearance of the 33-year-old found human remains in Woodland in Ashford in Kent yesterday. This afternoon, a police diving unit and sniffer dogs arrived at the scene. Our special correspondent Lucy Manning is at New Scotland Yard for us now. Lucy. Well, in the last few minutes, we have just had from Sarah's family a statement released by the Metropolitan Police. It says, our beautiful daughter Sarah was taken from us and we are appealing for any information that will help to solve this crime. They say Sarah was bright and beautiful, a wonderful daughter and sister. She was kind and thoughtful, they say, caring and dependable, someone who always put others first. And they go on that she was strong and principled, a shining example to us all. We are very proud of her and she brought so much joy to our lives. That statement in the last few minutes from the family on a day that the search in Kent intensified. Police officers bring flowers to the gates where their colleagues are searching. As another policeman sits in custody, still being questioned about kidnap and murder. The flowers from the public, an attempt to give some comfort to Sarah Everard's family. They are still waiting for answers about what happened to the popular 33-year-old from York after she disappeared last week, walking to her house in South London. How could the simple act of a woman walking home bring a massive police investigation to the remote countryside of Kent, where human remains were discovered yesterday? This quiet rural road in Ashford, the scene of intense police activity. Forensic teams spread out across a wider area. Divers and their equipment were brought in in this truck to help the search and portable offices brought in suggesting this will be a lengthy investigation. The suspect lived 30 miles away from where police are searching. A diplomatic protection officer in his 40s an arrest that has sent shockwaves through the force. An old garage in Dover where he used to work and that his family used to own was cordoned off and searched by officers. The police are determined to do everything they can to find out what happened to Sarah Everard from the moment she went missing, not just for her family's sake, but for all the women who feel unsafe walking alone at night. It is a disappearance that has touched many. The Prime Minister said he was shocked and deeply saddened. The Home Secretary added that every woman should feel safe to walk the streets without fear. But the reality, though, is that many don't. A private ambulance came onto the search site. Removing their caps, the officers gave their utmost respect. For Sarah's parents, sister, brother and partner, it is, as the head of the Metropolitan Police said, every family's worst nightmare. Lucy Manning, BBC News. The disappearance of Sarah Everard from a South London street last week has highlighted the issue of women's safety and prompted women to share their anxieties about being out alone. Our correspondent Judith Moritz has been talking to some women about their experiences. Alison and Adele are two of a group of women who run together in South Manchester. Last week, their friend was sexually assaulted here. It shocked them, but they say the police have been supportive and it hasn't put them off running. Women shouldn't change their behaviour. Men need to change their behaviour. People like that need to change their behaviour, but women absolutely need to be out there. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to think about where we're going, who we're going with. We, can, we should be allowed to run um, by ourselves on the canal, absolutely anywhere we choose, any time of the day or night. There's been a big debate online about the precautions some women feel they have to take when they go out on their own. Anywhere by myself, I'm constantly aware of men's footsteps behind me. Barrister Harriet Johnson had a huge response after posting on social media that every woman has walked home scared. 
The tweet came about because I was walking home myself from work. It was only about half past six at night, but it was already dark. And because of everything that had been in the news, I became very aware of my own surroundings. And it really struck me for the first time how common it is for me to be aware of my own surroundings when I'm out by myself. The latest homicide figures show that 695 people were killed in England and Wales in the year to last March. Almost three quarters of victims were male, whilst just over a quarter were female. The statistics also show that whilst it's likely for men to have been killed by an acquaintance or somebody they don't know, it's rare for women to be killed by a stranger and more common for a partner, ex-partner or family member to have been responsible. But some criminologists argue that the homicide figures are only part of the bigger picture. Murder statistics do not include missing people or people who have died in uh, suspicious circumstances that are not categorised as murder. But also the rape statistics are absolutely horrendous. The stalking statistics are absolutely horrendous too. So women are, th their fears are very real. Aya Hashim, Melissa Belshaw. In the House of Commons this afternoon, MPs listened in silence as Labour's Jess Phillips listed all the names of women killed in the UK over the last year where a man has been convicted or charged. Gwendolyn Band, Ruth Williams. The Home Secretary said that every woman should feel safe to walk our streets without fear of harassment or violence. Alison and Adele say they'll be out running again tomorrow. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Manchester. More than four and a half million people were waiting to begin hospital treatment in England at the end of January. That's the highest number since records began in 2007. The Royal College of Surgeons has called the situation dire and says it will take a long time to turn it around. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. Hospital wards devoted to COVID. The surge in numbers over the last two months led to widespread cancellations of less urgent types of care and there's still a backlog from last year's first COVID peak. Today's figures highlight again the scale of the problem. Charmaine has severe arthritis and last year was hoping to have a knee replacement. She was told in November she'd have to wait another 12 months. She's currently out of work and the task of finding a new job keeps getting harder. Devastated. I hate not being able to work. How do I say to a new employer, thanks for the job, but maybe in a couple of months I might need three months off um, for a knee replacement. Patient waits for non-urgent care have increased around the UK. In England, more than 304,000 had waited over a year in January for hospital treatment, including outpatients. As of December, in Scotland, over 39,000 patients were waiting more than a year. In Wales, which measures waits of over 36 weeks, it was over 226,000. In Northern Ireland, there were over 56,000 waiting more than a year, though this was just for hospital surgery. The total waiting list in England is nearly 4.6 million, but health leaders believe there are millions more who will need treatment. We know that there are other people who have not yet uh, been referred, so they've not yet entered the waiting list, but that could be for all sorts of different reasons relating to the pandemic, and they may well surface over the coming months into the waiting list, thus growing it even further. Some cancer checks have been affected. Kate's routine mammogram was postponed because of the pandemic, but nearly two months later she found a lump in her breast and then got referred for treatment. She thinks she was lucky. If time had passed and I hadn't had a mammogram for, say, six months, I might have been in a worse situation. It could have spread further. And there are people I've talked to who that's happened to. They've been diagnosed late last year, you know, six months after the start of the pandemic, and they've already got spread around the body. So. As far as I'm concerned, I was very fortunate. I found the lump and reported it to my GP. Kate is a supporter of the charity Breast Cancer Now, which estimates almost 11,000 are living with undiagnosed breast cancer due to COVID-19 disruption. NHS England said there were more than double the number of cancer referrals in January than in the first wave last April and more routine operations carried out. But the latest figures show there's a lot of ground to make up as well as coping with the continuing COVID challenge. Hugh Pym, BBC News. 
The latest figures on coronavirus show 6,753 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means that on average the number of new cases reported per day in the past week is 5,760. Across the UK, latest data shows the number of patients in hospital with coronavirus is 8,977. 181 deaths were reported. That's people within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, 163 people have died every day in the last week from coronavirus. The total number of deaths so far across the UK is now 125,168. As for vaccinations, almost 244,000 people have had their first dose of a COVID vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, meaning just over 23 million people have had their first jab and 1.35 million people have had both doses of the vaccine. Norway, Denmark and Iceland have all temporarily suspended the use of the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine. It comes after reports of blood clots among some who have had the jab. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, is with me now and that will worry a lot of people. Do they need to be worried? Sophie, the medical regulators say there's absolutely no evidence that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine causes blood clots. Now, they say there have been 30 cases of blood clots among 5 million people who've received the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, no higher rate than you'd get in the general population. And that's the same here in the UK, where 11 million people have received the Oxford AstraZeneca jab. Now, when you have mass immunisation, you are going to get sudden illnesses shortly afterwards, and they need to be checked out. Um, in Denmark and Austria, two people died of blood clots um, shortly after receiving the jab uh, or days afterwards. Uh, both people had doses from the same batch of one million doses that was distributed to 17 EU countries. None of those doses came to the UK. And some countries like Italy have decided to spend use of that one batch. But the European regulators and the regulators here say the benefits of immunisation far outweigh any potential risks. Fergus Walsh, thank you. The time is coming up to 20 past six, our top story this evening. Prince William breaks his silence after the interview with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, saying the royals are very much not a racist family. And coming up, the virtual show must go on, how the Royal Shakespeare Company is bringing a Midsummer Night's Dream to the stage using virtual reality technology. Coming up on Sports Day in the next 15 minutes on BBC News, the cross-code rugby great Sonny Bill Williams has retired from both union and league. The all-black double World Cup winner is making a return to the ring. Lockdown has brought with it a puppy boom. As demand soared, so did prices. And fraudsters quickly spotted an opportunity. More than 6,000 people have been victims of pet scammers in the past year. Most answered adverts online from people claiming to have puppies for sale. They paid a deposit and then never heard from the so-called seller again, as Angus Crawford reports. You've put a massive hole in our hearts that now we're not going to be able to fill. A puppy she wanted to build a home around. We were going to call him Humphrey. It's just it's awful. The scammer was totally believable. Sent video and pictures. The price was good too. A thousand pounds. Ashley even agreed a time to pick up Humphrey. Sent 200 pounds as a deposit. Then the messages stopped. I was heartbroken because I don't have any children. No one has a bit of joy these days. We're all in lockdown. And to give that love and attention to something new in your family and it be taken away from you. It's just, it's awful. What do you think of these people? It's disgusting. Across the UK, there are many more cases like Ashley's. Since the first lockdown last year, there have been 6,366 reports of pet scams, costing victims more than £2.4 million. In just a couple of days, we've managed to contact scores of scammers, selling puppies for up to £1,200 each. Some use really basic Instagram or Facebook accounts, others much more sophisticated websites like this one. They claim they're in Leeds and Susie's still for sale, but it's all fake. 
So what have you got to say? You're ripping people off. People want puppies. They've set their hearts on puppies, and you're ripping them off. Well, that's quite unfortunate. You know where I am. Just come and get me if you want to get me. But uh, I gotta go now. So. so tell me. We think he's outside the UK, and there's little chance the police will ever track him down. <laughs> say hi to Rhubarb and her owner, Mandy, who's also a breeder. It's gut-wrenching. It, you, um, you feel very violated. So this is my father. She found pictures of rhubarb and her father on pet scam sites, stolen by criminals and used to trick buyers. It's happening to other breeders across the country. The number of upset people I've heard of who've lost money on deposits for puppies that, you know, they, their children were expecting to receive a puppy, etc. So there's the emotional loss as well as the financial. Um, and it's a real common story. Um, and then to think you might have contributed towards that, it's, you know, it's awful, awful feeling. Demand for puppies has never been higher. For many families, a bit of light in lockdown. For scammers, just another business opportunity to exploit. Angus Crawford, BBC News. John Lewis has warned of further store closures after making its first ever annual loss since it was created 150 years ago. The retailer made a loss of more than £500 million in the 12 months to the end of January. The closures would be in addition to eight already announced in 2020. Sakir Starmer has launched Labour's campaign for England's local and mayoral elections in May. In a speech this morning, he emphasised his support for NHS workers and called for people on the NHS front line to receive a pay rise above the rate of inflation. A vote for Labour is a vote to support our nurses, our doctors, our NHS staff and to reward our key workers. When I clapped for our carers, I meant it. The Prime Minister clapped for our carers, then he slammed the door on them. A major study is underway to determine what the long-term health effects of COVID-19 might be. The genetic details of half a million people were already stored in the Biobank UK database before the pandemic. Now it's carrying out detailed scans of thousands of people to see how their organs might have been affected by the virus. Our science correspondent Rebecca Morell reports. Searching for the after effects of COVID. These scans are part of the world's biggest imaging study, shedding light on the long-term impact of infection. This is Brian Shepherd, who's taking part in the research. The 71-year-old lives in Gateshead with his wife, Jean. In November, he was taken to hospital with COVID. When I got in the ambulance, my wife's standing on the pavement and you think, we're going to see her again, you know. After five days of treatment, he was allowed home. But months later, he's still feeling the effects and hopes the scans could explain why. We're all very proud to have taken part in it and feel that our little bit can help somewhere along the line for the rest of the world. The scans are being carried out by Biobank UK. It's a huge study that holds medical images, genetic data and health information on half a million people. Now it's imaging 1,500 of these participants who've had coronavirus. They range from asymptomatic cases to those with long COVID who still feel ill months after infection. Having these standardised scans both before and after infection, researchers will be able to investigate the, the direct effects of coronavirus infection on changes in both the structure and the function of organs, which is obviously what we all want to know these scans could provide vital clues about the impact of COVID on different organs. The virus infects the respiratory system and damages cells in the lungs, so scientists will be searching for any scarring. They'll examine the heart for inflammation or muscle damage and to see if this is worse after a severe infection. The virus also affects the brain and this study could pinpoint where in the nervous system these changes are happening. The brain scans can tell us whether there's evidence for inflammation in the brain that may be persisting, um, and whether there's been damage enough to, to actually kill nerve cells in the brain that may cause some shrinkage. These scans will be repeated over the coming years and made available to researchers all around the world. 
our understanding of the pandemic's health legacy is just beginning. Rebecca Morell, BBC News. Less than six months ago, the American artist Mike Winkleman, known as Beeple, was unknown to the art world. Today, his digital work, entitled Every Days, The First 5,000 Days, sold at Christie's for $69 million. The collage of 5,000 individual images is the first ever sale by a major auction house of a piece of art that does not exist in physical form. And it has rocketed the 39-year-old into the top three most valuable living artists. Now, it's almost a year since the curtain came down in theatres across the UK. Now, the Royal Shakespeare Company is using the latest technology to get audiences back to the theatre. Spencer Kelly, who presents the BBC's technology programme Click, has this report. You shrewd and knavish sprite. What hast thou done? It's a Midsummer Night's Dream, but not as you know it. Dream is a new performance inspired by both Shakespeare's original play and the times we live in. As the actors move about, their performances are captured and used to animate Puck, Peas Blossom and the rest of the inhabitants of Fairyland. And over 12 live performances, the actors will partly improvise scenes based on which way the online audience chooses to guide Puck through the forest. In many ways, this is less like theatre acting and more like the kind of acting that Hollywood performers have been doing in CGI films for quite a few years now. You can interact with a fellow performer in the same space, but what you actually end up looking like, well, that's up to the digital artist. Inexplicably, I've become a kind of Power Ranger who I don't think was in the original Shakespeare text. So what are the differences between performing in mocap and performing just live on a stage? Well, on stage, a lot of it is through eye contact. But if you can't see that the two characters have eyes, how else can you express that? How can you tell that you are talking to someone if you're giving your attention, your energy to them? Is that a suspicious eye contact or is it a welcoming, oh, it's lovely to see you? This project has been in development for a couple of years now. So rather than just being a stopgap while theatres are closed, this is a full on R&D project to explore how theatre can continue to evolve. Theatre is always innovated. I hope that the technology in a way becomes invisible, so we can have cutting edge technology drive it, but ultimately we want the experience of the audiences to be delightful, entertaining, magical and meaningful. Dream runs until the 20th of March without the weird Power Ranger. Spencer Kelly, BBC News. <laughs> Time now for a look at the weather with Sarah Keith Lucas. Well, Sophie, it's been quite a wild day of weather out there today. Not only have we had some strong and disruptive winds, but we've also had some really active, heavy showers. This picture is of some Mamatas cloud that was spotted by one of our weather watchers in Devon. This type of cloud is associated with the cumul cumulonimbus clouds, so thunderstorm clouds. And we've certainly had a lot of heavy downpours and thunderstorms, and that theme will stick around for the next few days. We've got further strong winds in the forecast and there'll be a mix of some sunshine and some heavy showers too. More of those showers to come through this evening and tonight, rattling through on that brisk westerly wind. Most of the showers will tend to ease away across parts of eastern England, so becoming largely dry overnight here, pretty chilly too, temperatures around two degrees. Towards the west though, we keep the heavy showers, the thunderstorms too, and across Scotland, some of those showers are falling as sleet and snow over the highest ground, so some icy conditions developing here first thing Friday. Friday, cold start to the day. It will be another day of sunshine and heavy showers. A bit like today, but probably not quite as windy as it has been today. The showers will tend to ease away in the east, so some drier, sunnier weather likely here. Plenty more showers all day in the west, and temperatures only about 6 to 11 degrees on Friday. And again, you will notice the strength of the wind. So gusts about 30 to 40 miles per hour, perhaps a bit stronger than that around exposed coasts and hills in the west. Moving on into the weekend, low pressure still not far away, so another windy day to come on Saturday. Higher pressure trying to move in by the time we get to Sunday. But I think Saturday, another day of blustery northwesterly winds, bringing that mix of some sunshine, some showers, some sleet and snow over the highest ground in the north. Probably the driest weather towards the south and southeast, but still quite cool for the time of year, with temperatures only about 7 to 10 degrees. Sophie. Sarah, thank you. And that is it from us. Now it is time for the BBC's news teams where you are. Goodbye.